Welcome to the audio commentary for the Quantum Leap episode, A Little Miracle. I am so excited to have the writer of that episode joining me today for this commentary. I'm excited to see what he has to say and his perspective on the episode uh, since he came up with the idea and wrote the episode. Professor Sandy Fries. Hi, Albie. Thank you very much for having me. We did an interview not too long ago, and thank you for the interview. Thanking you also for letting me do the commentary. I love the interview you did and uh, look forward to doing the commentary with you. Awesome. So uh, everybody at home, this is going to be synced to the Mill Creek Blu-rays. If it's not quite synced with yours, it's okay. You'll still get a lot of cool information from Professor Freeze from this. Okay, so everybody start the episode now. Well, that is such a beautiful visual. I love that visual. It was it was shot so long ago, but it looks beautiful even today. It holds up so well. I like the effects they did for the leaping and stuff, and that was all uh, done. It was before digital, so they really had to. I think they went in there and uh, like made those special effects, draw, drew it on. They did it optically. Is that what it's called? Uh, yeah, it's it's optical. And, and the, the amazing thing is. It works today visually. It, it's just beautiful. It's breathtaking how, how well it works. In later seasons, they uh, I think the last season, they went to do special effects on uh, VHS, and you could tell the, the the degradation in quality is not as good as the these earlier episodes. Okay. Now, this is, a, I, this is phenomenal. I love this scene. <laughs> <laughs> What inspired you to write this uh, leap in? Well, the oh boy beginning of the episodes, I, I always thought it was a great idea. And if there's anything that's going to be an oh boy, <laughs> this is an oh boy. <laughs> this, is an about as, this is about as significant an oh boy as I could imagine. I gotta, I gotta give Dr. Sam Beckett credit for not just getting up and walking out of the room. I mean, he, he grabbed the powder and he, and he went to do it. And but 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 it was played nicely by uh, Scott Bakula, who is kind of looking down and looking ashamed and looking nervous, but he goes through with his uh, act that he needs to go through with. But I, you know, like what the heck could be more of an oh boy than that? I'm sure there are other oh boys that I forget that were pretty cool. I can't think uh, of any more. Um... Shocking, oh boy. Yes. Usually it's a situation <laughs> he might get punched, he, 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 there might be a, something going on, but nothing, nothing like that. I'd rather get punched than go through what he went through. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, loosely based on the Charles Dickens novel, uh, Christmas Carol, right? Uh, I have no comment whatsoever <laughs> on that. See, in this version, we know it's really happening. In, in that version, uh, was it a dream or was it real? What do you think? Well, it was a book. <laughs> <laughs> that I can tell you for sure. Oh, now look at this. This is my favorite spot. When I lived in New York City, mm -hmm. this was my favorite spot in New York City, this Rockefeller Center. Did Is that why you wrote that in there? You know something? I wrote it so long ago, I don't remember if that's why. <laughs> All right. Probably, possibly, but I loved Rockefeller Center, and it's a great visual to open the whole episode with. It, it definitely sets the episode, you know, exactly where you are. Exactly. It's, it's the nicest place in New York City, according to my sensibilities. <laughs> and I lived in New York for a long time. I think movies and TV shows set in New York seem to have a certain magic to them. Oh yeah, it's it's a magical place. It's a phenomenal place. I love I love New York City. Uh, what what's your thought on the actors in this episode? Uh... You know, I I got to tell you, everybody did a sensational job. Uh, I haven't seen this episode in a long, long time, and as I'm watching it now for the first time in years, oh, there's my favorite part of the episode. My name. Uh, <laughs> I, as I'm watching it, you know, it's just amazing how well everything holds up and how beautiful it is. 
you know, the, the, the way it's shot, the way the actors do their pieces. Uh, that's just beautiful. I haven't seen this in many, many years. Mirror shot. So was that required? Did you have like a list of requirements for a, a quantum leap script? I don't know if I'd call it requirements, but things they would expect you to do. Uh, if my memory's correct, and it may not be, the mirror thing was something they liked to do. Now, what we're doing here from a writer's perspective is this is called a setup. We're setting up who the characters are, what their situation is, and there's three acts in any kind of story, the setup, the conflict, and the resolution. So this is considered act one, the setup. To let everybody know what's going on? Yeah, what's going on, who the characters are, what the situation is. And the trick is to set it up in a way that does not sound expository and too obvious. Is, is, it, is it difficult to write exposition without it sounding like exposition? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's difficult because you're setting up who are you in this episode, who is the person you're working with, what's the situation the person's in that you're working with. So you have to, you can't say, oh, Sam, it looks like you're the butler. <laughs> you can't do that because that's, it just doesn't work. You have to do it in a relatively subtle way so that you're setting everything up, you're setting up the characters. But you're doing it in a way that doesn't look too obvious, and that's entertaining. I just invite him to the Pentagon and let him go through the files. I uh, don't care what those doves on Capitol Hill say, sir. War is inevitable. I only hope that we have the good sense to strike first. We will never go to war against Russia. And that's Charles Rocket, who I believe has passed away. Yes, uh, committed suicide. Oh my gosh, that's horrible. Mm. Which uh, he, he, he he did in the original timeline in this episode, his character did as well. Oh gosh, he was on Saturday Night Live, mm. and I I think he did a super job on this episode. You know, he looks the part. His acting is is great. strange about here lately? Definitely, sir. Hello? It worries me. Perhaps we should consider termination. Hello? Oh, you think we should fire I, I don't know if you uh, noticed it, but there was just a very cool camera move where the camera sort of pans a little bit and pushes in at the same time. There it goes again. There's the camera move. That's like on a like on a track, right? Like in a dolly? Is uh, that how they do that? My guess is on this particular move, it was a camera crews could be three people crews sometimes. And this person who does nothing other than push the camera. Uh, this was a sort of semicircle move. So I'm guessing it was kind of a hand pushed kind of a thing. If, if it's a straight move, that's called a tracking shot. If it's on a track, a literal, literally a little tiny track. Sir, Stanley Kubrick invented tracking shots. But, you know, as I'm watching this, I'm looking at the camera moves, I'm looking at the lighting. Look how sophisticated the lighting is here. It looks almost like a scene out of a movie in, in terms of the beautiful sets, the camera moves, the lighting, costumes. It looks like a movie. That's how good it is. Very high quality. You could tell everybody was very talented and hardworking on this show. There, there, nobody drops the ball, hardly ever, on, on the whole series. No. Um, was it difficult finding the voice of the characters? Uh, for this show, not at all. Uh, they're, they're so well-crafted by the creator of the uh, series, Donald Belisario. They're so well-crafted that you could, you could put your head into their heads very easily. And that's a function of the characters being well crafted well thought out you know i'm looking at it 
from a character perspective, but also from a visual perspective. Look at that! Look at the set for Pete's sake. That is a gorgeous movie caliber set. Melinda McGraw uh, playing uh, Salvation Army Captain Laura Downey. We meet her here. Uh huh. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about her character? Well, you know, you want to have, if you can, you want to throw in a possible love interest for your main character. So that was one of the reasons she's in there. Uh, you know, I saw, I haven't seen the episode in a long time. I don't even remember. Was there a little bit of something going on between Sam and her character? I want to say towards the end. Yeah. Okay. I, I think. But there's the there's there's always the potential and that kind of a thing, right? Yeah. There's that there's that uh, chemistry and that um, good feeling tension. And and there was was there a little bit of maybe maybe they'll get together? I don't even remember. I haven't watched it since December. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't watched it since about uh, at least ten years. Oh wow! So it's all new again. Totally new, and it's beautiful. The man, oh man. I'm so impressed. How about this? What do you think of uh, Jean-Pierre Dorliac's uh, costuming in this, especially well, Al? Let me, let me tell you. Let me tell you something. The Al costuming is very clever because the rest of the set is very muted. You got like it's all like green, white, and black. And it was very clever to have Al in a sort of Hawaiian, very very crazy colored shirt to sort of break up the visual. Uh, kind of mutedness of the whole scene. I think that was great. If you notice, everything else is muted colors. Now here comes the beautiful Al shirt. Yeah, loud colors and blinky lights. Yeah, and if if you imagine the scene without that great colorful shirt, it looks pretty bland visually uh, because, you know, that's what that kind of an apartment would look like. But it's beautiful the way it works with Al and his punching his his thing and it's a very it's a it's a funny scene too. But a be- man, the visuals are so cool, so cool. Now, when you saw the elevator doors close like that, when I worked on Star Trek: The Next Generation, the way those elevator doors usually close is you got one big guy on one side and another big guy on the other side, and they literally push the doors closed. <laughs> <laughs> That's not by any means a real elevator. It, it works. Yeah, the holodeck, uh, all the elevators on Next Generation were two guys. Uh, I think at some point they advanced to a pulley where you'd press a pulley and it would close both doors. But it looked very scientific and cool, but it was two guys pushing <laughs> together two pieces of plywood. I think I remember one time seeing a uh, blooper reel of all the miscues when the people walked into the doors. Now that last shot we saw, the last shot, you know, the quality of that, I, I, I'm just so amazed because I haven't seen it in such a long time. That's not a TV show kind of visual. That's a feature film kind of visual in terms of the complexity of the set, the beauty of the set, the cost of the set, uh, how the camera's moving. You know, I, I look at all of that when I'm looking at anything, almost anything. When I watch a TV show, ever since I was a little kid, I'm always thinking about things like the camera moves, the dialogue, look at how the camera is moving now, look at what the dialogue's doing now, look at what the interaction is between this and that character. So I'm always automatically on autopilot analyzing this kind of stuff. And I, I have ever since I, I was a little kid, when I was like 11 or 12, I used to try to predict dialogue or try to predict... Uh, I remember watching, uh, what the heck was it, uh, Magnum P.I., saying, okay, now there's going to be a helicopter shot. And he snapped my fingers and boom, there was a helicopter shot. So I was always, and still do, whenever I watch TV or movie, it's hard to turn off this automatic analytical thing that runs through my head about dialogue, characters, camera moves, lighting, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't know how I got this way. Probably by watching a, a whole bunch of TV when I was a kid. I used to spend, when I was a kid, four or five hours a day sometimes watching TV. Myself as well. <laughs> and luckily, it, it was worthwhile because it paid off. It you did. Know, as a TV writer, 
you know, I've written animation, I've written live action, and four, five, six hours a day of TV is a great thing to get you ready for that. The idea of having him be from the neighborhood and being uh, growing up as a poor kid, wh where did that come from? You, you know, the thing is, you've watched this episode many, 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 many times. Uh, I've written for so many shows, and I have not watched it as many times as you. And there are things that I just, I don't remember. I'll have fans come up to me sometimes and say, oh, that piece of dialogue in this episode was, was so cool. And they'll tell me the dialogue. And I, some, sometimes I don't even remember I wrote the dialogue. You're probably thinking in your head, oh, but it sounds like something I would write. <laughs> <laughs> Only if it's good. <laughs> Only if it's good. <laughs> if it's a lousy piece of dialogue, I think, nah, nah, it must have been somebody else. <laughs> it must have been somebody else. Yeah, the good stuff. That was me. Yeah, I've said that actually as a joke. <laughs> the good stuff. Yeah, was it good? Oh, it was? Yeah, that was me. And I, I say that jokingly. You know, on this kind of a show, uh, producers, associate producers, pop into the equation with adding things as well. There was just a ja it looked like a Jasper Johns painting in the background of the American flag. Yeah, I saw that. How how darn cool and clever and sophisticated is that? It's not your typical thing you'd expect in the background. I think it was Jasper Johns, and those things sell for huge amounts of money, so it's a nice way to visually establish that the guy who lives in that room is very, very wealthy because he could buy something of that huge monetary value and, from my point of view, very small artistic value. In terms of art, it, I don't get why something like that would sell for millions of dollars. But anyway... Uh, for something like that for television, would they borrow that from a museum or would they create a, a copy of it, prop replica kind of thing? Uh, I'm guessing they would create a prop replica. The reason for that is Jasper Johns, if my memory's correct, that's who it looks like. He's very easy to copy. Uh, so you wouldn't want to take a real painting by him and risk losing 10 or 15 million dollars somebody made off with it so it was probably made by a prop guy what was it like seeing scott bacula speak your words you know it's phenomenal because he's such a remarkable fine actor that he adds so much when he does the dialogue when he does the you see in the first scene he's it's about more than just dialogue. It's about facial expression, body language, camera angle, camera movement. And everybody on the show, certainly Scott Bakula, adds so much to the script. It's called plussing. They plus it with their expression facially. They plus it with their inflection and the delivery of the dialogue. They plus it with their body language. You know, so you're taking the script and making it really come alive. You're really, really plusing it times 10 in terms of what the script has. The script is basically a blueprint. Uh, the actors, the cinematographers, the sound people, the special effects people, all plus, 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 plus the thing. And on this show, everybody pluses it every way you could possibly imagine. There are other shows where they minus things, but on Quantum Leap, everything is plused. Were you a fan of Quantum Leap before you wrote this episode? I liked it uh, a lot. I'm not sure if I'd call myself a fan. I, I loved it. I liked it a lot. It was a clever idea, beautifully executed. But, you know, I don't know if I, I... I am a fan now because I realize after having written for it what a, what a sophisticated, brilliant show it is. You know, the actors are brilliant. The technical people are brilliant. The visuals are brilliant. Here we're looking at some more amazing visuals with done a long time ago but still works you know there are a lot of tv visuals movie visuals that might have been done 20 40 50 years ago that just look look bad uh looking mm. back but look at how beautiful these visuals are and the music is great the editing is great the visuals are great the music is great the special effects are great the, the everything works the, the actors man this is as good as it gets was Charles Rocket's character, uh, Michael Blake, based on any other rich New York billionaire? 
building Not buildings. Ours. I'm trying <laughs> try, I'm trying to say it without saying it. Um. Uh, <laughs> I uh, the answer to that question is totally fictitious, not based on anyone alive, okay, or ever having been alive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's absolutely completely fictitious. Okay, all char- <laughs> all characters in this were are fictitious and not based on anyone in real life. Any coincidence uh, with anyone? And, and any similarity or dead. may yep. be a coincidence. Yep, <laughs> and that's that's correct. Look at the way these guys. These brilliant actors deliver this dialogue. How phenomenal these guys are! Yeah, people don't realize the nuance and the talent that goes with delivering dialogue the way it should be delivered. Yeah, I, I think uh, a big part of the show, besides the writing, of course, the writing. Without the writing, there's nothing. Um, but uh, Scott Bakula's performance really carries the whole series through. You know? Yeah, he's the guy. He's a phenomenally talented actor. This looks like a back lot at Universal, actually. Universal has a lot of... Yeah, that definitely looks like part of the back lot at Universal. And music is also beautiful. Mike Post did the music for this, I think. Velton Ray Bunch did the original score for the first few seasons, but then it switched to Mike Post. And he did this I, episode. I gotta tell you, Mike Post is one of the most admired, talented people when it comes to the work he has done for television he's done some of the best music for tv shows that ever existed charlie was killed yeah about four years ago how he got drunk damn fool jumped out in front of a bus what you're looking at now is probably a tracking shot and the way you can tell is the camera's moving in a straight line, which means it's probably on a little track that the camera can roll on. And and again, Stanley Kubrick, if my memory is correct, cr- created the tracking shot for a movie he did called Paths of Glory. And I, this is New York. I remember dozens of times I was in New York when I lived there getting chestnuts. Is that where I got the idea for this from? <laughs> I, I don't I don't remember, but I wouldn't be too surprised. I, I liked uh, Michael Blake's smile for that little walk that he did with Laura. There's so many little details and nuances that, that are going on here. You know, look at Charles Rocket, what he's doing with his face, what he's doing with his body language, what the other actor's doing. The, the character's really letting down his guard. Oh, yeah. Charles Rocket is kind of somewhere between kind of stiff as a person and wanting to lighten up and become more of a human. You could see that in, in what Charles Rocket is doing with his face and his body. You know, he wants to become a real human here, but he's still kind of stiff. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then something happens and he goes back to being how we first met him. Exactly. Now, now he's sort of melting towards being a human a bit. Are are all those uh, emotions or a lot of them written in the script? How how do you communicate that? That's not in the dialogue for people who don't now write and read scripts. That's, yeah, that's a great question. The key things uh, that you really need to happen in a script, you will write in a descriptive part of the script. Just off the top of my head, for example. I would write in this scene, uh, Blake is stiff, he is awkward, he starts to melt towards being more of a human, but he just can't make it yet. So that would be a descriptive sentence in the script. Uh, You know, his melting to humanity has to be gradual in the script to be believable. So, you know, the way I would have written it again off the top of my head is something to the effect of <sighs> Blake is still his stiff character, but you see the beginning of melting towards humanity, period, or something to that effect. And again, the character has to gradually melt and become more human 
or it's not viable, it's not believable, it's not credible. Does that make sense? Totally. And uh, then the actor takes that information and builds on builds their character on that. And if they do a good job, uh, sure. you see what you intended them to do, right? And sometimes they nail it, exactly. sometimes not. It, yeah, exactly. Sometimes they pull off what you wanted to happen, and sometimes they miss. In this particular episode, everybody pulled it off. And you only write that kind of stuff about character metamorphosis or character shifts where it's really important for everybody to be on the same page, you know, the director, the actor, the camera person. Uh, in that particular scene, you had to describe as a writer what was going on with the characters because dialogue is only one way that you communicate in a script. Other ways are descriptions of an actor's body language, facial expression, wardrobe, uh, demeanor. If you're doing a piece of dialogue, if you want an actor to be angry, you could write Blake, parentheses, furious, close parentheses, and then the dialogue. So you want to try to be as descriptive as you can outside the dialogue with key things that need to happen. Okay, here we go. Ah, oh, I love that shot. I love the visual of that. I've, I've been in that location so many times. If anybody goes to New York, go to, go to that place. And in the background was the NBC building, which at the time may have been the RCA building. When RCA owned, owned NBC, there's a skating rink in front of the big tall building in the background. It's, it's just an idyllic, beautiful place. I love watching the tree lighting every year. Uh-huh. Man, that is a huge tree. Did you write it that big? <laughs> <laughs> Did I write the tree that big? Yeah, how do you Not, write a tree? I don't know. You'll be, well, you just say Rockefeller Center at uh, holiday time, and anybody who's been to New York knows what that visual is. I, I say it's the most majestic visual in all of New York City, regardless of the time of year. Okay, now, now we're getting interesting here with the characters. Was there any significance to the time you set this in? December 24th, 1962. Oh, okay. 24 is two numbers away from my birthday, which is 26. So that's probably why it was 24th. Uh, 1962. Mm -hmm. Two and six are my lucky numbers. So uh, that's why it was most likely two and six at the end. You know, there's things in my life that are two and six just popping up again and again and again and again. You know, it was I, I loved my grandparents. They lived at 2136 East 28th Street. Uh, my light, my license plate has twos and sixes in them. My birthday's twos, two and six. Whenever I write something, if there has to be numbers, I just put a two and a six in it. Uh, if there's a woman's name... It'll be my current girlfriend's name, or current <laughs> wife's, or current wife's name. <laughs> you, you get you get extra points for that, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. For a while, it doesn't last too long. <laughs> I didn't write you a song, but they just said your name on NBC. So exactly, exactly. I have a friend who writes Star Trek novels. A former girlfriend of mine. I thought would be impressed by having her name in a Star Trek novel, but <laughs> you know, she was impressed for about twelve minutes in that, and that was the end of it. <laughs> It really is one of the best. It really is. I don't. I don't know if it's just because it has the amazing quantum leap enus to it, but also the Christmas added in just makes it you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. You know, one of the reasons I think it's such a well liked episode is because it deals with one of the big universal themes in life. You know. It deals with several big universal themes that people, viewers, emotionally connect with. One of the big themes is, do miracles exist? That's a huge theme in the episode. The other is, what does it mean to be a good human being? What is that about? What do you have to do? Those are two huge, huge themes. The other big theme is, 
what's important in life? Is it money? Is it career? Is it friends? Is it family? These are powerful, powerful, powerful universal themes that probably every viewer has dealt with and has a big emotional response to. And that's that emotional response through the universal themes is what makes an episode powerful or not powerful. If it were all about people singing songs and making fudge, there's no universal theme and it has no emotional power. It's amazing how uh, a good story can pull you in and make you feel like you're experiencing it yourself in 44 minutes. What, what happens is it's a story of Sam and Al and Blake, but it's also the story of millions of viewers who have gone through the big questions like, are there miracles? Was that just a miracle that happened to me? Uh, or, gosh, I've got a great career going. What's going on with my family and my wife? You know, these are huge issues. When you're watching this kind of an episode, consciously and or subconsciously, you're reliving the emotions of what happened to you in your life as a viewer, and that's where the power comes from. That's why, in a way, you could say Sam is your your avatar in a bunch of emotions that you've had before and a bunch of problems you may have dealt with before. And when you're talking about a person's emotional and life-changing experiences, you bring them into the episode. You don't see yourself as a viewer in the episode, but in a way you do through Sam and the other characters. When I'm watching, I definitely uh, put myself in Sam's, you know, that he's my window into the whole thing. I'm experiencing what Sam is kind of in my mind. Yeah, he's your, he's your avatar. Mm. And and Sam and the other characters give you little lessons on how to have a better life as a viewer. It's not like somebody lecturing at you going, yes, everybody, there are miracles. Let me discuss miracles with you. Let's talk about what a miracle means. What would be the definition of a miracle? Well, here's my opinion. You know, if you, if you lecture about it that way, people turn off and are bored. If you do it in a dramatic way with entertainment, with some jokes, people put themselves into the story and consciously and subconsciously think, how does this relate to my life? What can I learn from it? How can I become a better person through this? You know, after I see a terrific film or TV show, I usually say to myself, what did I learn from that? How could this make me a better person? You know, I can always be better. Uh, you know, Forrest Gump, when I finished watching Forrest Gump, I said, man, what a great film. What can I learn from Forrest Gump as a character to make me a better person? That's powerful stuff. You know, he was honest, he was tenacious, uh, you know, and he, he had miracles happen in his life. So what's really happening, I believe, in a lot of these kinds of stories is you're saying, how do I become a better person? How do I relate to these characters? You know, that's the power of the episode. There was an episode of Next Generation. Uh, another writer did it. I wish I wrote it called The Inner Light. It was all about family. It was moving. It was dramatic because it's a universal theme that everyone relates to emotionally and powerfully. And that's what you try to get into in any kind of well-written story. Now, I hate to say this because this is sort of undercutting all the wonderfulness, but the idea that this would run every Christmas and I would get more residuals because of that was also a factor in the equation. <laughs> Besides uh, the miracle, uh, miracles happen thing, I think the biggest lesson in this is, like, be kind. Well, that's a huge message, you know. Yeah. Before before you and I as friends were talking about that before we started recording and the importance of being kind. Uh, now, you would think that's a simple message, but it's a message that I would guess 50, 60 percent of humans forget about. They forget the. there's power in being kind. There's magic. There's miracles in being genuinely kind and loving. You know, 
the, there are times where I make a real concerted effort to be as kind and thoughtful and loving as I can be, and I see magic happening in return. Maybe I'm deceiving myself. Maybe I'm delusional about it. I don't think so. Uh, you know, I, I could give you a bunch of examples, and I think I gave you a couple of examples in the interview I did with you where that, that was the case in my life. You know, there's power in kindness. There's power in love. It sounds like a hokey cliche, but it's for real. Is it a simple concept? Be kind? Yeah, it's very simple, but it's also something that people constantly need to be reminded about. I, and I think stories like this about being kind and, and the importance of it, I, I, one episode might not change somebody overnight, but I think if you're growing up like I was, and I was a teenager when this uh, was coming out, and, and you see things like this uh, uh, again and again, you see those messages, and it just you realize that that's the way you want to live your life. You want to be kind. You want to treat others uh, with respect, and you want to you want to not be a, a jerk to people. Yeah, yeah, and yet there are lots and lots of jerks. The going throughout, very cool visual. The, the set, look at that chandelier. Holy man, look at the bed. Holy mackerel. And that's that's very much what a room at the plaza looks like. And again, there are people who live there full time. Wow. <laughs> you, have, you have to have loads of money to do that. Yeah, if it's no object, why not, right? Ex yeah, Blake had loads of money. And the Plaza Hotel is one of the most historically uh, and aesthetically revered places in New York, along with places like Rockefeller Center, Lincoln Center. You know, those places are some of the most beautiful places in, in New York City. And I remember any time I used to pass by the Plaza Hotel, if I had to go to the bathroom, I would use their bathroom because it was the nicest bathroom on the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it was just beautiful. It had marble and all kinds of amazing stuff. Yeah, Dean Stockwell's acting in this scene. Yeah, I like the way he's he's doing the whole body language thing. And look at look at Charles Rocket's facial expression. <laughs> He's trying to convince Sam that there's actually someone there. Yeah. It's interesting in Quantum Leap to have Sam pretend not to see Al when usually he's the only one that can see Al. It's kind of a cool switch, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a nice little switch. <laughs> Makeup and costuming and that. It's just crazy. <laughs> I like to look at the tongue stuff he's doing. Yeah. Dean Stockwell with the tongue. Green Having a good time lipstick. there. Yeah. They're, they're playing it very good that it was really cold, but it was probably filmed in June or July, I'm guessing. That looks like an... That looks like a backlot set. Uh, I do not remember when it was shot. Maybe I was dreaming because I have been working pretty hard lately. No, sir. It's possible. I mean, they say that dreams can be leaving so soon. Here's the next one. Here's the next one. With me. Would this be the universal backlot that they've filmed on mostly? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I recognize a lot of it. Why did you bring me? Really great back lot. Have you walked up and down the streets of those places and like those houses oh. sometimes? Uh, it, there's one corner in the on the back lot set that you see in so many Quantum Leap episodes. And I wonder if those are just like shells of houses or can you actually go inside uh, them? Most of them, for the most part, when you go in a door, oh, look at that visual. Holy mackerel. Most of them, what does that say? Blake Plaza. Okay. Most of them, when you go in the front door on a back lot building, right in the front door, it's just nothing. It's just plywood, and it's a big facade. There are a few that have a little bit of a room inside them, but most of what you're looking at is all facade. Let's say you have a character walk into uh, a back lot exterior, so he opens the door, walks into the back lot exterior by opening a door, 
then when you cut and he's in a room, the room is a completely different set. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Blake appeared despondent as he left the courthouse today. Mr. Blake, is this the end of the Blake Empire? I've made some mistakes, but I'll be back. Analysts say that Blake, once considered a brilliant corporate raider, was undone. Did the visual effects people uh, do this the way you envisioned it in your head when you were writing it? They did it a lot better. Oh wow! You know the thing that the thing that I was most uh, concerned about was how they would pull off the very last uh, kind of deal. The, the dialogue is something to the effect of uh, this is from a long time ago, but Sam says something to the effect of that was a nice touch that you put that star up there, and Elk says something to the effect of uh, I didn't put it there. And I was kind of concerned how they would do the star you know would it be too small so you couldn't get the meaning would it be too big so it looks hokey but they got the star just right and they got the visual elements of that just right you know when you're writing a script i remember writing that scene and and by the way this was co-written you know i'm not the only writer on it so I remember writing the scene and thinking, how will this look visually? Because I, I imagine the scene as I'm writing it. I have an imaginary screen in front of my face. And I imagined where the star would be, how it would look, what the dialogue would be, what Sam and Al would look like. So I played the whole scene in my mind with the star. And then after I finished doing the scene, I said to myself, man, I hope... The star's not too big or too small or too medium because this the whole episode could be blown on a special effect that looks hokey or wrong. You know, if it was a, just to give an example, if it was a huge star with tinsel hanging from it and shining lights, that destroys the whole episode because it looks fake and hokey. But the people who did the visual in that important scene did a terrific job and, and the image I had in my head they did as well if not better in terms of how they interpreted it for the screen so you know as a writer you I visualize every scene how, how the characters moving what's in the background what's the lighting like what's the dialogue because everything works together none of those elements are separate units like in the scene we're watching now, right. the lighting has to work, and the character movement has to work, and the dialogue has to work all together. So I play out the scene as I'm writing it to make sure all of those elements work together. God. If this scene were poorly lit, the scene is destroyed. Yes, sir, it's all over. They lit it just well. It's a dark scene. They lit it darkly, but you can still see Sam's face. There's, it's, it's such an intricate process. People, anybody who thinks this is easy, it's not. It's a very intricate process to put together something that works well. You know, it involves lighting experts, film experts, or video experts, writers, actors, editors, people who do the music. I could go on and on, and they all have to work together for the intended proper end effect. And it always amazes me when it works so well. Did you watch this on the night it was on television? Do you watch your own shows? Yeah, I do watch my own shows. Oh, my gosh. That's perfect. Look at that star. Oh, my gosh. That's the moment that you get the chills. Yeah, and they did it beautifully. Oh, my gosh. How beautiful is that? I think so. I'm getting the chills now. I'm getting teary-eyed. Mm, so is Sam. Yeah. Mm. I'm going to let this play out and not say anything. Go on, sir.
you know what's a miracle? When over 100 people, well over 100 people, the artists, the musicians, the writers, can come together to create something that works together so well. I guess he never builds the plaza, huh? No, he does build it. And he puts the mission on the first floor. Hmm. I wonder if he would have knocked on that door if you hadn't put the star up there. I, I didn't put I didn't put the star up there. Merry Christmas, Al. Merry Christmas, Sam. Wow, I'm telling you, I'm getting teary-eyed. You know, <sighs> that was such a well-done scene. They totally, totally did a beautiful job on that. You know, for me... Speaking over that scene would be just wrong to the actors and the technical people who did it. Why the hell are you here? Hmm. Beverly Leach. Oh, really? Yeah, that's uh, who just kissed him and smacked him. Uh, watching that episode at home when it aired, did you have that feeling like, yeah, that really worked? You want to know something? Absolutely yes. And I remember even getting a little bit weepy as I was writing it because I just knew the potential of the power of the scene if it was done correctly with all the people working on it. Uh, so, yeah, I, even, even though I'd been over the script so many times and just thought about the episode so many times when I saw it and when I'm looking at it now... It still is very, very moving to me. You know, it's amazing. A and again, it, it maybe it's a miracle that all of the people who work on the show, uh, all the technical people, the art people, the wardrobe people, the actors, it's a bit of it's a miracle that they can work together so beautifully to create such powerful peace. It's a very, very collaborative kind of enterprise. It's not like writing poetry where it's you and the editor. Uh, I've never counted the number of credits in Quantum Leap. I'm guessing there's at least 100 people working on the show. But it's always amazing when things come together so well and work together so well. There's so many ways a TV episode or a movie can go wrong. If the design of the sets is off it makes the whole piece unbelievable if one of the actors are, is off that blows the credibility of the whole episode if the lights are way too bright in key scenes that destroys the effectiveness of the final episode's effect so it always amazes me when things work so well together because there's so many ways it could go wrong. Did you write them singing at the end or was that, did the episode come in short and they just thought to put that in? Any, any, any idea about that? I do not remember writing singing at the end. I, I definitely absolutely remember singing at my desk and writing that last scene that I absolutely remember vividly. Uh, the singing at the end, I don't think that was mine. Uh, I don't remember that at all. And uh, it, it was a nice touch, whoever came up with it. You know, uh, I don't think the singing was my idea, but it's it's really nice touch. Uh, it, it's great to watch the episode. I haven't seen it in many, many years. But just the concept that it has an impact on millions and millions of people who watch it, that's just phenomenal. Really, really gratifying. And again, I'm one of many, many people who contribute to that final effect. Thank you so much, Professor Fries, for joining 
me today for the commentary for the Quantum Leap episode, A Little Miracle. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. And if you want to know more about Sandy, you're in luck. He wrote a book. It's called Secrets Your Textbook Will Not Tell You about TV, movies, and life. And I read it, loved it, and I highly recommend it. It's available, of course, at the Amazon and where all the good books are sold. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, Thanks for taking the time to talk with me. And I really appreciate your interest in the show. And thanks to anybody who's listening. I really appreciate your watching the show.